I'm sorry. Is this your personal policy statement dealing with these issues? No, no, we've talked about utilities last week. Is that included? I'm sorry. Do you include that as a policy when you said about utilities? Yeah, absolutely. I think it seemed to have some very immediate results. We saw the governor suddenly expressing a great deal of concern about the public service board, and we saw the public service department raising an issue. Raising an issue that just as background, some of you may have read the Rutland Herald today, the public service department was in fact raising a very good issue in terms of the allocation of costs that CVPS charges its consumers. And some of you may recall that this is exactly the same issue that we raised in Burlington in terms of our own rate design and whether or not residential rate payers were having to pay more than they should be paying. And it's good that that issue is being brought up. Okay. Okay. Let's begin. First, I want to make it very clear that I do not claim to be an expert in agricultural policy. I am a city boy. I've never lived on a farm, nor have I exhaustively studied the economics of agriculture. But this I do want to say. There is probably no more important issue facing our state than the need to fight for the preservation of the family farm in the state of Vermont. And if elected governor, I intend to be very much involved in that fight. The continued existence of the Vermont family farm is not only important for economic reasons in that it provides us with 30,000 jobs. The continued existence of the Vermont family farm is not only important for environmental reasons in that it is our hardworking farmers who are keeping our rural areas green and open and beautiful. As important as these issues are, there is another issue which is even more important. If we sell our farmers down the tube, if we allow the family farm in Vermont to die, and we are losing this year some 200 farms in the state of Vermont, if we allow the family farm in the state of Vermont to die, we will be selling out our heritage and our traditions and the qualities which help make the state of Vermont one of the most unique and beautiful states in the United States of America. Ronald Reagan and the United States Congress would like to see the family farm in America destroyed and be replaced by large corporate agribusiness. There is no secret about that policy. If elected governor of Vermont, I will do everything in my power, both within this state and in Washington, to change that policy. Today, I would like to outline a few of the steps that I would take in agriculture. Other proposals will be forthcoming during the course of this campaign. And as I've said often, on issues as complex as utilities or agriculture, it really is impossible to cover them in total within the context of one press conference. I want to concentrate today on primarily financial aspects of farming and what the state of Vermont can do. Number one, financial assistance to economic beleaguered farmers in Vermont must be significantly increased. Today, the state of Vermont makes available to business and industry throughout the state hundreds of millions of dollars of tax-exempt financing through VEDA, the Vermont Industrial Development Authority. There is absolutely no reason why the agricultural industry of Vermont should not be able to receive a substantial portion of these low interest loans. Number two, the state of Vermont presently through VEDA has a direct loan program which in 1983 provided over $1.4 million in direct loans to industries around the state. There is no reason why Vermont farmers should not be involved in this program as well. In 1985, Governor Cunin and the legislature approved $400,000 for direct loans to Vermont farmers. This program proved to be highly popular and requests for funding from the farmers was far greater than the $400,000 could accommodate. Far more requests came in than this program could accommodate. Given that reality, I cannot understand why the governor and the legislature allowed the program to die in 1986, why it was not refunded. 
clearly this program must be greatly expanded and as governor i would seek to fund it at a rate of two million dollars annually what we're talking about here is a good program in which the requests for the money far exceeded the four hundred thousand dollars available what we have got to be talking about is providing more money for that program not defunding it totally if vita vermont industrial development authority can provide 5.2 million dollars in low interest bonds for the Sherburne Corporation, which operates the Killington Ski Area, surely the state of Vermont can provide low interest loans for farmers struggling with high electric bills, rising property taxes, and other increasing expenses. If VITA can approve $8.5 million in revenue bonds for the Stowe Athletic Club Association to build and equip an athletic club and conference center, surely the state of Vermont can provide low interest loans to the sons and daughters of Vermont farmers who wish to carry on the family heritage. If VITA can provide $4 million to the Vermont gas system, a private utility, for expansion, surely we can provide low interest loans to help establish more agricultural co-ops in the state of Vermont. If elected governor, I will make certain that farmers are well represented on the board of the Vermont Industrial Development Authority. To the best of my knowledge, uh, there are no farmers on that board, and that the farming community is not well represented today. Let me conclude this initial statement on agricultural policy by saying that today I have concentrated on outlining some new ways the state of Vermont can help the threatened Vermont family farm. Clearly, clearly, there are other areas that we must address, such as the whole issue of taxation of farms, support for the creation of a state land bank, the public purchase of development rights of prime agricultural land, and refocusing the efforts of agricultural research and the extension service to better meet the needs of small and medium-sized farms. Confronting the challenges to agricultural development and removing the impediments to a viable farm economy will not be an easy task. There are no panaceas. But as governor, I can assure you that the strengthening of Vermont's agricultural economy and the development of a sane farm and food policy would be one of my highest priorities. I look forward to receiving the advice and assistance of farmers during this campaign as we develop these programs and strategies to advance the position of agriculture as a vital component of the Vermont economy and to preserve our precious heritage. Thank you. Do you, you want to uh, increase financial assistance to farmers, increase uh, VITA loans by $2 million and other financial assistance? Right. How are you going to finance Okay, well, I think there are two areas. Um, Number one, in terms of VITA loans, what VITA does is make available to uh, the business community loans at the same interest rate that the state itself can get it through tax-exempt financing. So what you're not really talking about is direct financing here. What you're saying now, that in a state which has the capacity to expend about $200 million through VITA, what we're saying is that we want the farmers themselves to have a significant chunk of that $200 million. That's not really an expense for the state. It may VITA end up... It's funded through... The, Pardon me? VITA is funded by the state. Yeah, the VITA administration is funded by the state. But basically what we're saying is this is tax-exempt financing. And you're saying to a private corporation that instead of paying perhaps 10% that you would get at the bank, you might be able to get 8% rates, okay, that the state itself can borrow it or the city of Burlington can borrow it. And that's what basically that program is about. And what we're saying now is that farmers themselves have not been treated in the same respect as the other parts of the business community. In terms of your other question of how we make direct loans available, I think this is that's a good question, and that's consistent with overall tax policy. As you know, we are supporting the Vermont Fair Tax Initiative. We believe that the state of Vermont can raise at least $50 million of new revenue in a fair and progressive manner. Certainly the major areas that that new revenue should address is the problems of the property tax in terms of the funding of education and municipal service, the problems of social services and the cuts in pro federal programs to low income people, but we consider that needs of farmers fall within that area that should be funded by that additional money. But is the, uh, is the Fair Tax Initiative uh, something that can become a reality in the legislature next year? You as, as governor would support it, but you well, I, I, you know, I, you, you, that gets a little bit off the subject. I think clearly that the Vermont, you know, as, as the campaign progresses, I will be making statements about what I think should do with additional money. And obviously, if we don't have the additional money, I'm not going to be able to do that. I think it's fair to say that the Fair Tax Initiative forms the nucleus, the kernel of what this entire campaign is about. 
That same question, John, could be asked, are we going to be able to increase funding for the cities and towns? Are we going to be able to expand the state aid to education program if we don't have additional money? All I can say is obviously that's a, that's a fight that we're going to have to make. I think it's long overdue, the whole issue of decoupling. I think we will do as we have done here in the city of Burlington, where the progressives have never had a majority. We will explain to the people of the state of Vermont what the options are. Either we can ask wealthy individuals and corporations to start paying their fair share of taxes, or we're going to have to keep raising property taxes, we're not going to have enough money to fund social services, we're not going to have enough money in this case to help the farmers of the state of Vermont. My job as governor would be to make the options very clear to the people of the state and fight for a sane program, and I think we would have public support for that. What are you going to, uh, as mayor, you haven't had to deal with statewide agriculture policies. And, and you are absolutely correct. That's, and, your, and your perception out there is not exactly as a champ outside of Burlington, and even in Burlington, is not as a, somebody who pays a lot of attention to that's agriculture correct. policies. What are you going to do to overcome that? Well, I think one of the things that we're going to be doing is spending a lot of time with people who know a great deal about agriculture. Uh, we are working with rural Vermont, getting information and the ideas uh, that the people in rural Vermont have assembled, and I think they have done an extraordinarily good job this year. Uh, I will be speaking to a number of farmers. I believe next week I'll be in North Troy talking to some farmers, and clearly I'm going to have to learn from the farmers. We have already met with farmers uh, as to what their concerns are and what they see as sensible solutions to the problem. Do you see this as a uh, major uh, defect in your, in your well, I mean. You know, as I indicated, it is no great secret. I, I would not attempt to suggest to people that I am an expert on agriculture. But I think sometimes, I mean, there are a lot of things even in the city of Burlington that I'm not an expert on. You learn. You learn, A, and you get the best people who are prepared to implement a good policy. In other words, I am sure that Ronald Reagan has around him a lot of very fine experts in terms of agricultural policy. People are very knowledgeable about agriculture. Unfortunately, what they want to do is see the family farm in the United States of Vermont, the United States of America, destroyed. That is what their knowledge, that is how their knowledge is being used. We will find people who are going to fight to preserve the family farm in the state of Vermont. And there are, of course, Vermonters who are in the middle of that fight right now. Uh, and we'll get the best advice from farmers that we possibly can. Would you agree that agriculture is a weakness issue for you? I, no, I won't. I mean, it, certainly in terms of my own knowledge, I do not want to pretend that that's something that I've had a lot of experience. As mayor of the city of Burlington, I have not. But I think we are going to go out to the very best people in the state and get the information that we need. And I think all that I think that I would ask people to judge is judged by the policies that we're advocating. Do you have any uh, farmers on your campaign staff who are advising you right now? Or we do. We do. But I, I think it would not be right to, to mention those names now. But we do. We have already met with farmers and we'll be meeting with more farmers. But, but you I don't, don't have want any, anybody regularly on your staff. Well, I've been relying at this point from Anthony Polina for some uh, some good advice. And Anthony, as you know, it, it, while not a farmer, has done an excellent job uh, in terms of heading rural Vermont. And I think through Anthony's efforts and the efforts of other people in rural Vermont, they really had a tremendous impact on the state legislature this year. Do you think it would be a difficult transition going from the mayor of the only real urban center in the state to the governor of probably the country? Yes. Well, I think it's, it's very clear that in the last four years, there is no question that my experience has been uh, revolving around the problems of, of a city. There's no question about that. And I'm the first to admit that it's necessary for me to learn a whole lot about agriculture. But I'm confident that I can do it. And I'm confident not just that I can do it, it, it myself, but that you get a staff of people who are willing to fight tooth and nail to preserve the family farm. You don't have to be a great genius in agriculture to understand the need for financial help for Vermont farmers if you want to preserve them. You don't have to be a genius to say that when you have a program of $400,000 and the requests coming in are far greater than that $400,000, that the intelligent approach is not to cut that program. You don't have to be an agricultural genius to understand that. You haven't so, talked much about uh, Governor Cunin's record on agriculture. Well, I've indicated, I'm sorry. Are you satisfied? No, I'm not. And there is there are a number of other areas that I just briefly mentioned, uh, even in terms of, of uh, direct funding of, as many other states are doing, we have, it, as you know, here in Burlington, a very fine farmer's market. There is no reason why the state of Vermont itself should not be actively involved in making sure that we have farmer's markets all over the state of Vermont. 
There should be better coordination in terms of marketing Vermont's products. I don't think we're doing as good a job in that area as we should be doing. But once again, as the campaign unfolds, we'll be talking about more specifics. But I think what we're here to say is that certainly as important as any other area associated with agriculture is that it is no secret, we're losing 200 farms this year, it is no secret that farmers are hurting financially. And I think what somebody in state government has got to say, and I'm prepared to say it, is that we are going to make a commitment to fund agriculture. Now, for example, I will give you an analogy, and it's an interesting case, the relationship of what we do in a city as opposed to what you do for farms. In one sense, it's very different. In another sense, it's not. Here in the city of Burlington, as you know, we have the problems associated with housing. The city of Burlington, every single year, one city alone spends about $300,000 in terms of rehabbing substandard housing in the city of Burlington. The last three years, we have made significant progress, I think, in improving the housing stock in the city of Burlington. One does not have to be a great housing expert to understand that if you target money and you say we want to upgrade substandard housing in the city, you can do that. One also does not have to be a genius in agriculture to understand that if farmers are hurting financially, they need low interest money, that if you make that money available, it certainly will be of help to Vermont farmers. How much does VITA have for loans? My understanding is they have a capacity of up to $200 million. Uh, one problem, one reason farmers seem to be going out of business is because there's a surplus of commodities like milk. Right. And you're, couldn't it be said that by giving these farmers low interest loans, you're pouring good money after bad? Okay, you're raising a good question. And, and again, one of the things, that I, and I really want to say this as sincerely as I can, no matter what issue we talk about, you know, you're never going to hear me say that Governor Cunin is the fault of all the problems in the world, and so forth and so on. These are complex issues, and in this instance, directly related to federal policy. Okay, and all that we can say here is that if federal government lowers the price that farmers can sell their milk for, that is a major problem that affects the, uh, the state of Vermont. And all that we can do is fight in Washington to change that policy. Uh, I think in terms of the question of limiting the kinds of milk that farmers can sell, one of the things that people believe about the dairy uh, buyout process is that you're not going to accomplish that. That while some farmers go under, other farmers are going to be adding more and more cows to their herds, and in fact you're not going to see a decline in the amount of milk that's being produced. So what's the solution to the, the surplus then? I think higher, clearly, clearly, right at the heart of what one of the solutions is. Okay, and I'm not giving you a definitive statement, is higher price for milk. It is no secret that year after year, farmers are being asked to sell their milk at either the same price or lower price, while everything else they have to deal with uh, increases. And we will not accept the fact that, does that mean, therefore, that when you go to the Grand Union, you'll be paying higher prices for the container of milk that you get there? Because the answer is, and this is really at the crux of the problem, is you have the middlemen who are basically ripping off the system. The cost of milk to the consumer is not declining. The cost of other farm products that we have to buy at the store is not declining. The farmers are getting less money, and somebody is making very, very hefty products, hefty profits. And those hefty profits are being made by the, by the commercial, the, the, the corporations that are in the milk. Won't more farmers want to produce milk and continue producing milk if the prices that they're getting for it are higher than you know, okay. just... Okay. Yeah. And I think what you can do, that's a good question, but I think what you can then say is determine what is a reasonable amount of milk that should be produced and say that if farmers are producing over that, you will in fact have a very low price for milk. You can discourage at a certain level, but I think what I'm trying to say is the answer to that problem is not to wipe out large numbers of family farms. The answer is to have a high price for a certain amount of milk. And then on top of that, to discourage farmers from producing more, you will have a low price. Isn't that kind of what they have now? No, that's not what they have now. What they're having right now is, is clearly through a whole variety of mechanisms and effort, and it's an admitted policy in the, in the United States government. I don't think there's any secret. Ronald Reagan and his friends believe in social Darwinism. They are of the view that a small family farm cannot compete with large corporate farming. I don't agree with that. I think that small family farms can, and it has been proven, can be run efficiently. They may not make as much money as gigantic farms. Uh, but I think for a thousand reasons, we should be fighting to preserve the family farm. Yeah. How, do you, how do you deal with the, milk, the federal milk price support system? What do you think is a, a fair level for how much weight? How do, you, do you think that should be phased out? I mean, how do you no, I do not believe in the so-called free economy. Uh, for farmers. I think clearly that the price of milk now is too low. I can't tell you exactly what would be a fair price, but certainly it should be not insignificantly higher than it is at the present time. What about the federal price support system, the subsidy that, that right. farmers get for hungry weight? What do you think should be done with that? 
I think that that should be raised. I think what you're talking about right now is making a very, this year, to the best of my understanding, it has declined by 10%. Raise the federal price support level, right. say it's, it's now, like it just got cut to $11. Precisely, $11. right. You raise it to say 13 or 14. Well, I is, I'm not president of the United States, so I wouldn't raise it, but I would urge that the United States Congress, in fact, do that. That's exactly correct. What, one at a time, please, Alex. How, how, uh, how would you pay for that? Well, one of the things that you may or may not know is that substantial amounts of that program are being paid for by the farmers themselves. So I think the answer, how would you pay for it? Well, I, Mr. Reagan apparently is not wrestling with how we would pay for a trillion dollars for Star Wars. He is not worrying too much about how we would pay to destroy the government of Nicaragua. He's not worrying about tax breaks for major corporations. Again, this is a question of national priorities. I believe it should be a national priority to preserve the family farm. Would you have any stipulation burning on this $2 million as to what it would go for? For example, I believe the $400,000 um, in the program of the last year, I think that was seed money for diversification to, you know, if you want to start a turkey industry or blueberries or strawberries or something like that. Any stipulation in this $2 million? Yeah, I think that they would be. I mean, I, I think clearly, you, no, even if you put five times as much money as, as the previous program had, there's no question that you're going to get more requests for that money than you'll have money available to. So I think you're all going to have to develop priorities. Diversification is not an unreasonable one. That's certainly an area that we want to look at what the potential is of vegetable farming in the state of Vermont, uh, uh, pork production, beef production, and so forth and so on. That would be one area. There are a number of areas. There would have to be priorities, and I'm not prepared to tell you one, exactly. One of the things that's happening now, and I've heard this from several sources, that the whole herd buyout program, regardless, is not working because the objectives of that program was to cut the amount of milk. That's right. And what is happening, farmers are seeing their paychecks right now with the assessment being taken out of the work for 3,000. Precisely. Marks. And, and they're adding they're cows. Start, they're going to start crying. And the people that are in business have got to make this up, this loss, they're going out and they're buying more cows. Precisely. And yeah. and That's exactly the point that I was trying to make, Archie. That, that is exactly what my understanding is. But you find one farm is going out of business and the next farm is adding. What I'm asking you, yeah. with this two million bucks for, for guys to go out and, and buy more cows and more equipment and more land and whatever they need, grain and so forth, I mean, operating expenses just to pour more milk into the market. I, I, I wonder if that's what is. Well, okay, I won't get into the specifics now other than to say I think it's very clear that, that farmers do need financial help. Just, uh, I just wanted, in the, with the context you're coming, just to clear up an earlier question John asked, if you have farmers on your staff, and I think you said you do. No, I don't think I did say that. You don't? No, I said that I relied on Anthony Bellina for a lot yeah. of help. We'll continue to rely on Anthony. We are talking to farmers. We are going to have support from farmers, but I think it would be a little bit premature at this point to announce are what you they are. Are you going to get some agricultural people on your staff? Tonight? On our paid staff? Are no. Well, we have already. I mean, these statements are not being made in a vacuum. They're being okay. made with the help of active farmers. I wanted, wanted to also ask just, in a nutshell, your understanding of what is the fundamental problem with the dairy industry in this country right now? Well, I think I addressed that. I think the fundamental problem facing the dairy industry in the United States of America is that you have a president and a Congress that believe in a social Darwinism in terms of agricultural and economic development. And their feeling is that you give favorability to large corporations and to agribusiness that as they do in virtually all aspects of our social life, you allow rich people to get richer and you allow the family farm in the state of Vermont and in the United States to decline. There is not a great deal of sympathy with the small farmer, nor with the worker, nor with the low-income people in general. That is the basic cause of the problem. Clearly, clearly, well beyond what we can do in the state of Vermont, there is going to have to be a change in national priorities toward the farm from one end of this country to the other. And there are farmers and good people from coast to coast who are making that fight. If elected governor, I intend to play an active role in that situation. I, I think I want to reiterate this point. I do not believe, and please forgive me if you thought that anything I said might indicate otherwise, I do not believe that all of our agricultural problems are going to be soluble within the state of Vermont alone. Clearly, there is going to have to be a change in national policy, and that a governor of the state of Vermont concerned about agriculture is going to have to play a leading role in that fight. Just to, to follow up on that, I know we, we were a dairy state, our people in Washington were I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear your question. Start again. We are a dairy state. We are a dairy state. Our people in Washington uh, work hard on this on the dairy programs. Right. And, uh, I know from them, they've always uh, told me that the fundamental problem in the dairy industry in this country is we got too damn much milk. 
we got about a million cows in this country that we don't need. The, the milk is going buried underground, whatever. I just wonder if, uh, aside from the politics and the social Darwinism you alleged to be running the White House and the administration, do you think that we have a problem with uh, a milk surplus? No, I don't. I mean, I think for me, the basic issue is that in a world which has several hundred million people starving to death, I am not convinced that it is appropriate to be taking millions of acres of farmland out of agricultural production. I do not accept that. But you don't think the, the problem with the dairy industry is the fact that there are too many cows, there's too much milk being produced? No, I do not. Not the basic problem, no. That is a problem that has to be dealt with, but it is not the basic problem. And then, I just, just on the price support situation, you, you said you support increasing the federal right. price support. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the dairy industry is already controlled by agribusiness, and would not increasing the price supports pour more money into the very corporate agriculturists that... That's uh, right, and that is a very good point. You're absolutely right, because a lot of the money that goes to agriculture in this country, in fact, goes to very large corporate farming, and that is clearly an issue that the federal government has to deal with. We do not want money? to... No, by changing the policy. Again, what we're talking about is a policy directed not to encourage the growth of large corporate farming or tax loopholes for wealthy people who allegedly are farmers. The goal of what the policy that we are talking about is to put money in to protect the family farm, not corporate farming. So it's not simply a question of adding more money, but it's a question of developing policy. You know, it's like tax reform. People are in favor of tax reform, but sometimes tax reform really results in giving tax breaks to the rich and not the poor. The other, uh, your two opponents, have worked in state government a lot longer than you have, and uh, have experience dealing with farmers in the legislature and as lieutenant governor and as governor. What is your advantage over them? How are you gonna, uh, how do you distinguish yourself from their experience? Well, I think experience certainly is important, but I, I think developing correct policy and having a definitive goal that you're prepared to fight for is in fact more important. I mean, as I indicated before, I'm certain that the United States Department of Agriculture and President Reagan, President Reagan's agriculture advisors have a great deal of experience. I think clearly what is more important is what in God's name you want to accomplish. And what I am suggesting, and I believe this very strongly, that the preservation of the family farm in Vermont is not just an economic issue. I mean, it's more than quote unquote, an agricultural issue or an environmental issue. If you lose the Vermont family farm, if you lose 200 years of history where people have done honest, real work to produce a real product, which is food, people who have developed and, and, and are respected for their honesty, straightforwardness, down to earth, if you lose that segment of our society in Vermont today, it will be a very, very grievous loss that you're not going to easily uh, replace. I mean, for example, one of the developments that's taking place in agriculture, of course, is as farmers themselves, family farmers go out of business, you're having larger and larger family, uh, larger and larger farms established, and farms are now being run by managers rather than owners. Okay, that's, that's going on all over the country. I think you lose something in that. Uh, one more question. One of the largest crops in Vermont is marijuana. And I don't know exactly what the figures are. Is there any reason those people shouldn't be on equal footing with other farmers, other producers in the state? Yeah, there is. The growing of marijuana and the selling of marijuana happens to be against the law. I mean, if we made the fact that milk was against the law, I suppose they would be on equal footing with our dairy farmers. But so long as the growing of marijuana is against the law, I would not suggest that they are on equal footing. Would you support legalization? No. Decriminalization? Something to look at. Something to look at. May I have another uh, question on another subject? Uh, okay, are we finished with agriculture? Okay, yeah, John. The, uh, the former police chief, Bill Burke, has said uh, he's thinking about uh, coming back coming back to town and uh, making a run for mayor. I wanted to get some thoughts on that. I guess Mr. Burke is being bored in his, in his new job. I really don't know what he is doing. I have not talked to him since he has left the uh, city of Burlington. Uh, he apparently felt that uh, he had outgrown the city of Burlington or for whatever reason, and, and now I suppose he's interested. I hear that he's interested in coming back to help us plot our future. If he comes back to the city of Burlington, if he chooses to run, I mean, like anybody else, he's more than entitled to. That's about all that I can say. Something else yesterday, uh, 
It's reported today that Bob Sherman was handing out copies of the Indies Times editorial. Bob Sherman was handing out copies yeah, of it? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, didn't I, know that. I didn't know that our governor's press agent reached the socialist press. Is this a usual well, phenomenon? I think he liked this week's mm -hmm. issue better yeah. than most. And uh, <laughs> I just, I know for years you've gotten that paper, and they've written about you quite a bit in the past and yeah. favorably. And, right. Uh, right. Yeah. And you want me to it's comment on it? a little surprising. I just wondered no, what you It's not think. a little surprising to me at all. The editorial suggested that a candidacy by myself would, quote unquote, split the left. Now, I do not want to speak for Governor Kunin. I really don't. I never will. But I'm not sure that Governor Kunin herself ever wanted to be called part of the left in okay. the state of Vermont. Uh, we, of course, don't agree with that editorial. We think that our friend in Chicago knows very little about what's happening in politics in the state of Vermont. We think that the, basically that the Democratic and Republican parties are essentially alike. We think we're going to win and we're going to do something that has never been done in the state of Vermont and hasn't been done in 50 years in the United States of America. So to our friends in these times and all those people who read it, we strongly disagree. Is it, is it at all? I mean, they even suggest that you run against Cunin in the Democratic primary. Well, I think I've dealt with that particular question about 500 times in my political career. No, I have no interest in being involved in, in the Democratic Party in the state of Vermont. Do you, uh, will you be responding to them in these times? Maybe. I won't be responding. To, I mean, there was a not no the editorial. There's nothing new. Uh, they think that I shouldn't. They apparently think that the future of this country lies with the Democratic Party. Uh, that's fine. They're entitled to their opinion. But there is there's another aspect in the article which I won't get into now that I intend to respond to. If I, if I may add something else about the article that went with it, yeah. And, uh, is there's a reference to uh, a brief reference, but to uh, claiming that you've divided the Jewish community by your support for a Palestinian homeland. And, and that's news to me, and I just wonder if you have a response. Well, you're right. It should be news to you, because I've never said it, and it's an absolute untruth. And that is, in fact, what I will be responding to, not to the editorial. What, what will you be responding to? There's a statement in there alleged to me, which is absolutely inaccurate. When the reporter came up here, we talked about many things. One of the things that we most certainly did not talk about was the Middle East and a position on the Middle East, Middle East calling for the establishment of a Palestinian home state, obviously of great concern to farmers in the state of Vermont, is not something that I mentioned at all, did not talk about. So it's a totally, uh, grossly inaccurate statement. And that I will be, in fact, responding to, but not to the editorial. Okay. Thank you. Tony, when was that guy up to interview? Uh,